WNYC-TV presents Barbara Lee Diamondstein and... Cafe La Mama was one of the creative sparks that ignited the off-Broadway explosion. It continues to be one of the most highly regarded experimental theater groups in the world. It's a pleasure to welcome its founder, the remarkable Ellen Stewart. Thank you very much for joining us today. How did La Mama become La Mama? I suspect the warm welcome that I just gave to you was a little different than the greeting you received when first you arrived in New York nearly 30 years ago. Why don't we start from there? How and why, and for what reason, did you come to New York? I came to New York to go to Trap Hagen School of Design. I never went to that school. Um, instead, I managed to be a designer. I worked at Saks Fifth Avenue for seven years for Edith Lances in her custom-made department. Uh, she was uh, my patron. And so I did design for all those years without going to school. And all the while you were this designing woman, did you also have designs on the theater? I never had designs on the theater. It is only by a series of circumstances that I got involved. And mainly that was my interest in some people who wanted to do theater. Was your family involved in the theater? I, one brother and one friend, yes. Well, how does one who is suddenly comes to New York, can hardly find work, several months later finds herself in an executive position at a major department store? I assume you were pleased and somewhat surprised by that success. Amazed. I never really believed it. But uh, always, I will tell everyone that uh, I was like uh, Cinderella and Edith Lances was the fairy godmother. Why did you decide to give up that career? Well, I was ill. I'm for, ill for a few years, to which I freelanced in several different stores in New York, in Paris, in London. and. Um, I used to earn enough money and then take long vacations or I'd go on unemployment. And on one of these vacations, which happened to be in Morocco, uh, something happened and uh, which eventually led to my... What happened? Well, really, you know, Miss Diamondstein, it would take a long time to tell the story. It is just that something caused me to remember what someone very dear to me told me many years before, and that I should have a push cart in which I would push beyond myself and it would take me any place I wanted to go. And I uh, came back to New York to have that push cart, which was going to be to do theater for these people. Well, along about 1947, mm -hmm. Off-Broadway was founded. As I recall reading about, I was not in New York then, um, at the Cherry Lane Theater, performances of Shaw and Strindberg were going on. Then, along about 1958, a new movement started, what came to be known as Off Off Broadway. How did that begin, and what was your involvement in that? Well, in 1958, no involvement. I didn't even know what that was. But Joe Chino, who had Cafe Chino on Cornelia Street, started what later came to be called Off of Broadway. Actually, the term was coined by Jerry Tolmer, not at all in for any of us, but more for the work that the Judson Church was doing. However, the term became finally put to all of us in the kind of work that we were doing. Cafe Chino and La Mama, which started in 1961, were so-called little tiny experimental places, doing poetry, doing some dance, and certainly some plays that probably would never see the light of day in any other place. Along the way, many other little theaters have joined. The movement has become, this day, I think there are close to 300 some such theaters. And of course, you will find off of Broadway or similar situations calling themselves off of Broadway throughout the world. 
any place that is off Broadway or off Broadway is considered off off Broadway internationally. Yes, very much so. Where was the first shelter, the first housing for Cafe La Mamaan? How did it get its name? Well, we talked a little bit before I tell you involved, but Creek was 321 East 9th Street. Um, my neighbors took a dim view that it was in the basement where it was. They had tried to get me out. Uh, I didn't go. Um, the person, a Mrs. Lewotsky, who owned the building, defended my staying there, a wonderful man from the Ukraine. One day, an elderly gentleman, quite debonair, came to the little basement with a summons for my arrest because he had been told that a negress had entertained 16, 15 white men in six hours and he had come to arrest me for procuring. This complaint had been put against me from my neighbors. The man turned to be someone who had worked in theater several years before. We explained that we were making theater and the 15 white men were my friends who took shifts and anybody who could would come and work an hour helping to put the floor in, helping to put the toilet, uh, making the little theater. And, uh, he thought we should do this. He said we couldn't unless we had a name. Everybody called me Mama. He wrote down Mama, and somebody said a little more fancy, La Mama, <laughs> and it was La Mama. Well, it's also moved since then. It has yes. more than one location as well. Tell us something about the evolution of La Mama. Well, the evolution was certainly helped along by the city of New York, because in those days, one was not supposed to do entertainment without a license. So I was summoned many times, uh, arrested by the police through the building department, and subsequently had to move constantly in order to keep doing what I was doing. The evolution happened simply, the fates deemed that each place that I moved was a larger place. And as each place became larger, than the plays that the persons, the creative persons within our little institutions became different plays because a playing area that perhaps fitted only a single bed became large enough to fit a chair, two chairs, a table, and maybe a side piece or whatever. And this happened constantly considering that we moved in 1963 to Second Avenue between 4th uh, and 5th Street. And in 1964, we moved to 122 Second Avenue, upstairs over modernizing. And in 1968, we had to literally run with no place to go. Bowl and board on St. Mark's let me move there shortly in early 69. And in April 69, we moved to what is the present La Mama, and this was the place I was trying to build, which became our home. Uh, all those moves contributed to what is known as the evolution of La Mama. Is there a central philosophy in terms of the kinds of directors, the kind of plays, the kinds of performers that appear at your theater? And how has that arrived at? Who decides what qualifies? Well, I, people are La Mama's concern, really. And the potential people, or a person's potential, this is the thing that we are most interested in, and how that potential can be used to explore ways by which one can communicate with his fellow man. And hopefully, that communication is love in any one of its dimensions. So all of our energies are trying to create theater that can do this. Thus, the theater that we do, or aim to do, goes far beyond the spoken word. It must go to the visceral. It must go to the gut. And that is what we do. We achieve this, I think, to a degree, to a great degree, with music, with dance, as well as we never do anything without a text. 
However, whatever text that we explore, we beg the liberty to explore in the text that that text can communicate beyond itself, that we may show it in any part of this world, and it will be understood. It is our universal aim to communicate with all persons within the dimensions of love, if that will tell you. By those standards, what do you consider to be your most successful performances? Most well, successful we've had shows? several, and by those standards, I wouldn't like to name anyone in particular, because everyone, no matter the depth or the slight of his contribution, that contribution has served to make what is the whole. And I don't think you can ever underestimate any part of that. So as there are many, many persons whom I've had the privilege to, to work with they have made immeasurable contributions. However, whatever they've done could not have been done without the overall foundation of all the persons, the energies and the like that support the mama. And that support is international, as yes. is your approach. Has, have you or the company, and is there an existing ongoing company, traveled Several. to other countries and established yes. not only off-off Broadway, but La Mama East or West? Well, we have uh, companies that work and believe in our tradition. Certainly we don't administrate those persons, but they do say that they follow our philosophies, and subsequently we do work in just about every place in the world. We haven't played in Afghanistan, nor have we played in China. Um, however, in almost every other country, there is something about La Mama in those countries. In the almost two decades since La Mama was founded, the theater has changed and the world has changed. What are the most striking changes that have taken place in the theater itself? Well, I would think that it is the thing that I speak. Theater is not nearly so static as it used to be. I think a public now has come to accept our movement and our dance, our joy upon being the stage. I think the public has come to accept that it is one must not necessarily be talked to. Um, but then I don't think that theater this much is responsible. One has a tendency in this life today to ignore nature, and I think everything that is transpiring now is decreed by nature. The world no longer is this place that is so far away. Everyone is at the other person's fingertips. And nature has decreed that we join hands. And thus, we have to find ways to join hands. And through the arts, certainly, is a creative way. Well, obviously, you search for wider and wider audiences for your message, so to speak. No matter what form that message takes, there yeah. is a fundamental core. I wonder if, in that sense, uh, you've ever considered larger forums, like Broadway, like television. Well, many persons uh, in La Mama work in television, uh, they work in film, they have to because it's a way by which they can survive. Theater is a luxury. One cannot, for the most part, particularly our kind of theater, one cannot survive. There is no money to live. Television, film, Broadway, provide a way by which a person may be sustained. And I'm very thankful for all those media, and not just for that. There is a connection with all these forces this day because television in itself has become a challenge to the person doing theater only. He has to learn to survive with the media. And I think that in itself has provoked a new kind of creativity, which is wonderful, you see. 
Broadway, again, has served in much the same way, but not like television and not like film. So in spite of theater does exist, but it is only because it's having a not too gentle prod by this media. If you were given a Broadway theater, what would you do with it? Well, I would do the same that I am doing, but that theater would have to be a theater that could become an environment for what we were doing. In no way would I want a theater that we would have to bastardize or prostitute the work in that we could not present the work as we do present it. Well, how far can the audience be expanded for work that is, in many ways, so pure? And so? Well, I didn't mean so far as the audience expansion. I meant the physical setup. One has a tendency in creating no theaters to create something with a very rigid proscenium stage, a proscenium kind of seating, and one is prescribed to the proscenium. La Mama has never been prescribed to the proscenium. Rather, I've attempted in all these years always to have a space that the artist can create. And if one wants a proscenium, we can create that within. But no matter what the environment would call for, that our space can provide that. A Broadway stage, beautiful broad stage, Broadway stage could be very inhibiting, in fact, absolutely inhibiting. Perhaps it could serve one or two plays. But I'm much more interested in a place that can really be a part of our work. You don't direct any of the plays at no. La Mama. What is your role there, besides I'm being the, the mama. guiding mama? <laughs> that's, all, that's all that it is, you see. Who decides what plays are performed? It depends. Some of them I decide, and many of them, the persons on whom I've decided shall do the plays will do what they want. Again, I'm very interested in the person, and I'm much more apt to pick a person than to pick a play. Would La Mama be La Mama without Ellen Stewart? I'm very sure, because whatever is, was, and the was is the is, uh, perhaps not me, but if this force or whatever we are supposed to be was supposed to be, it will. Well, there are so many performing arts institutions that really are directly tied to their guiding and creative geniuses. But I'm not so creative, you see. The creation I leave to the geniuses. There are also so many performing arts institutions. You mentioned that just off-off-Broadway, there are already 300. Many, if not all of them, fighting for a slice of that very narrow funding pie. Yes. Do you think it would be a tragedy if some of them merged, or if some of them would go out of business? Well, I think it's a try. I don't know about merging. I think if persons had the inclination to merge, that they should. I don't think they should be forced to because of an economic situation. For persons, as you say, who are forced to go out of business, it depends upon what the term forced you mean. Uh, if for some reason they cannot survive, then it is because perhaps they will not you know, we cannot always have as we would have it a particular situation. However, given the situation, one has to survive within that situation if one wants that situation. And all the good that it brings and all that it does not bring. And so if it is only three walls and one needs four walls, one has to provide the fourth wall. There isn't a performing arts or a visual arts institution in the country that I can think of that is not faced with the most serious of financial problems. Right. It's obviously the case, I yes. assume, with your of institution course. as well. How do you get funds? Well, we have certainly had many people to fund us. The National Endowment, 
the Rockefeller Foundation, the New York State Art Council, Schubert Foundation. Uh, they have been uh, just wonderful. You know, the Ford Foundation um, has helped us. The um, but it's still Maryland not enough, really, for help us on occasion for the kinds of yes. programs you'd like to do. How do you go about expanding both the private foundation support, the public foundation support, and the general public itself? Well, we haven't been able to expand anything. Rather, we've had to tighten our sails. Quite the opposite. Uh, what we could do two years ago, we can no longer do. Why is that the case? Because we don't get the money. Is it because it's not this year's fashion to give to experimental theater companies? or is Well, it I think foundations are slowly phasing out. Of the arts not, business. Uh, yes, and it, it hurts. But then again, one does not throw the hands. Uh, you live within the circumstance. How much of your time do you have to spend fundraising and in non-theater activities? I recently spoke, spoke to a museum director mm -hmm. who told me he spent more than 40% of his task his time and what he considered non-essential, non-museum tasks, largely fundraising. It must be very discouraging. You know, my dear, I don't think it is so discouraging because considering with the United States, and we are quite bourgeois, I guess, to an extent, so far we have not progressed that much. It has only been perhaps in the last 50 years that subsidies or anything like that, even for museums, for the symphonies, become a popular thing. And considering that we haven't been around that long, and it took England almost 2,000 years or 1,000 years to, to do anything about funding. And even at that, it took them a long time to get started. We certainly can look across the seas and I have. France has been one of our greatest benefactors. They've given La Mama a lot of money. Germany has given us money. We've gotten foreign subsidies, which have helped us a great deal, you see. But all these countries haven't always funded their artists. And I think commensurate as to the longevity, if we would put how long we have existed in there, we're doing pretty good. And I think that we will do better. Do we need a national repertory theater in this country? How can we, in this country, have a national repertory company? We would have to have several, because our country, Germany has several national companies. And Germany, you can put inside any one of our states. So how can you take 50 states, the size, uh, the area that we cover, and cover it with one repertory company. We do need national recognition. We do, do we need, need regional repertory companies? Right. Yes. Do we need ethnic ones too? What do you think of this new third world acting company? Well, when you say what do I think about the third world acting company, why not? We've had third world acting companies from the time of La Mama huge third world programs, one of which is going on now in conjunction with the Year of the Child. Uh, we have our persons here from Africa, from Asia, from Latin America. We've been doing this certainly since 1970. Myself, I've been working in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America. La Mama has a whole third world contingent that's quite, quite large. that has been in existence, again, certainly since 1970. We have found groups and have groups that we work with in still in Beirut, in Tel Aviv, in Morocco, in Chile. I could name forever, you know. We work in the Sudan, we work in Nigeria, we work in Ghana. Uh, and this is something we quietly have been doing all these years. And besides, these troops and our troops have visited these countries. They are on our stages. The uh, Nigerian National Company has been on our stage. The National Company from Korea on our stage. So a whole thing about third world, it has existed. It does exist. 
and we've been doing it, so I don't see what such, except certainly we won't have a million dollars to do it, but we do have a track record that we have been doing it for what, almost 10 years. What's the emphasis of the program this year? Well, the year of the child, that program, uh, there's been and there is a great deal of interest because we've done the first phase and our delegates now will go both to Germany and to Sweden, the persons that have been interning with us, where they will continue the work. That's one uh, thing that we've been doing. Uh, I'm very happy that the Rockefeller Foundation made it possible for Ted Dois Cantor to come from the Krico Theater in uh, Poland. I certainly think that this was a highlight. I was delighted that uh, Joe Chaikin would do rearrangements at La Mama. So uh, was the public and the press. Well, how important is the work of criticism to your theater? I mean, do you, are you affected as much as, for example, Broadway by negative or positive criticism? Of course. A good critique, and we have a lot of people in a bad critique, and we don't have anyone. But what is very bad for us is no critique. And that's if what happened when the Polish theater came. Well, and it's not just the Polish theater. If, if the press or the persons that sit in jurisdiction would know how criticism is our lifeline, we are penalized by funding institutions if we don't generate audience and if we don't generate an income. And if no one knows what we are doing, then we can't do this. So it's, it's a vicious circle. What if we you? don't get a critique, we don't get the public, we don't generate the income, and then how are you going to get funds? It's true. We don't receive money for advertisement. So we can't really say that perhaps we should be recognized or get some lines in the paper. But if there would be any philanthropist in the world that would even subsidize an extra page that the likes of us could be covered, it would be the greatest thing in the world, I think. Well, thank you for giving us so much pleasure thank today. You. Thank you, Ellen Stewart, the founder of the quite remarkable La Mama Theater, and thank you, audience, for being with us, too.